The following program is sponsored by CBN. Coming up, the head coach for the NBA's Charlotte Hornets. Players today, they'll see right through you. Landing the dream job. Stay the course, stay together. And working with Michael Jordan. Good leaders I've been around, they go tap into that. On today's 700 Club. Well, welcome, folks, to this edition of the 700 Club. I've got some real good news, if you can let me start the program with that good news. Uh, last week, I had my 89th, 89th birthday. birthday, and so uh, there were some people who put up a challenge. They said, we want to put up a challenge of $89,000 to build water wells, because it, it coincided with National Water Day or Worldwide Water or whatever. Well, I'm pleased to report that against that challenge, we are, you raised $368,000. That'll so build some wells. <laughs> Oversubscribed at four to one. Amen. So isn't that great? And uh, so we'll, we'll drill a lot of wells, and there's some high-tech wells that have solar-powered motors, and there's a whole lot of stuff in there. But thank you very much, and we just are very pleased at that response. And that made it a super happy birthday, and a lot of people are going to have clean water all around the world because of it. Well, the report is out. No con collusion after 22 months, 2,800 subpoenas, 500 witnesses. Special Prosecutor Robert Mueller has cleared the president of any collusion with Russia and finds no obstruction of justice. Well, uh, our uh, Washington correspondent, Amber Strong, is going to give us a full report now. No collusion, the two words echoing through Washington Sunday. But as with most things here in D.C., division is growing. No collusion, no obstruction. The president expressing exoneration Sunday, celebrating the news with what else? A tweet. But Democrats led by House Judiciary Chair Jerry Nadler aren't convinced and want Attorney General Barr to testify before Congress. Attorney General Barr, who auditioned for his role with an open memorandum suggesting that the obstruction investigation was unconscionable, made a decision about that evidence in under 48 hours. Barr's principal conclusions of Mueller's report are broken into two questions. Did the Trump campaign collude with the Russians during the 2016 election? And two, did the president commit obstruction of justice? When it comes to collusion, Barr states, the special counsel's investigation did not find the Trump campaign or anyone associated with it conspired or coordinated with Russia in its efforts to influence the election. On the issue of obstruction, he writes, the special counsel states that while this report does not conclude that the president committed a crime, it also does not exonerate him. But Barr and Deputy AG Rod Rosenstein come to their own conclusion that the evidence developed during the special counsel's investigation is not sufficient to establish that the president committed an obstruction of justice offense. The overall investigation is the result of 22 months of work by 19 lawyers, 40 FBI agents, and includes 2,800 subpoenas, 500 search warrants, 13 requests to foreign governments, and 500 witness interviews. Still Democrats say they're concerned about Barr's partiality and vow to continue investigations into the president. Republicans say it's all an elaborate plan for impeachment. If anyone thinks that the Mueller report being concluded is, is the end of the Democrats' attempt to take down President Trump, they haven't been paying attention the last two years. A point of unity here in Washington, politicians on both sides of the aisle say they want the full report released. William Barr says he wants that too, but is working with the special counsel on how much of it can be released. No timetable on when that's going to happen. Amber Strong, CBN News in Washington. Well, Jay Sekulow is on the president's, he's the key member of the president's legal team, and Jay's joined us. Jay, is the president relieved? Is he happy? Is his joy in the White House today? There's a uh, happy spirit in the White House uh, last night, and uh, uh, including today as well. And the president, of course, is glad that this is over. And as he said from the outset, there was no collusion and no obstruction, and that is now the conclusion of this two-year investigation. And, I, you know, of course, as, the, as one of the chief lawyers involved in this case, I will tell you that, uh, Pat, I have appreciated uh, 
the prayers of a lot of people that are watching this broadcast right now. And our legal team did a a phenomenal job. God was gracious. And uh, a lot of uh, students from Regent University Law School uh, that became lawyers in the last, say, 10 years got to work on this case. So that was pretty historic, too. Let me ask you about the origin of all this stuff. There's a fellow named Christopher Steele, a Brit, uh, a questionable uh, gumshoe type, and there was that Fusion GPS dossier. Uh, how did all this thing start? Was that, can you tell us about who, yeah, the origin so, of it? Yeah, all? No, I can now. So this, there's this counterintelligence investigation that starts called Crossfire Hurricane. And that investigation is in large part based on FISA warrants and the Christopher Seal dossier, which also led to some of these FISA warrants. We now know, and as James Comey himself said, they were unverified and salacious. Uh, it was funded by Fusion GPS, and that uh, created a, 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 a very serious issue uh, legally uh, and politically, frankly, is what ended up happening there. Uh, the end result of all of this uh, was the fact that you have a uh, a development that took place and under the law, both under the law involving uh, this collusion conspiracy theory and obstruction, the fact was there was no evidence of either. And as the attorney general said, there was no evidence to bring forward an obstruction case. Bob Mueller called it difficult facts and law. And you don't bring cases when you've got difficult facts and difficult law. Well, what, what, uh, the president can fire an attorney general and he certainly can discuss cases with his uh, subordinates. How can that be obstruction? Well, the Department of Justice said it can't be, You'd, and you can't have obstruction by tweet. Uh, so the, whatever theory may have been proposed, and I'm, I'm kind of speculating on this, uh, as it was reviewed, so what you saw in the letter was where they, the, the, the line that says, well, the president, we don't conclude the president committed a crime. We don't exonerate him either. There's two points on that. Well, you know, prosecutors' jobs aren't to exonerate. They either ch prosecute or decline to prosecute. Here, they couldn't make a determination of whether there was a violation, so they, pursuant to basically Department of Justice policy, took it to the Office of Legal Counsel. That's the office that would look at the theory they're proposing, looking at the facts and determine if there was a legal violation. And the, the OLC, in conjunction with the Deputy Attorney General Rod Rosenstein, and the, and the attorney general determined there was not. In fact, if you read that provision of the, of the order, it says, in, catalog, in cataloging the president's actions, many of which took place in public view, the report identifies no action that in our judgment constitutes obstructive conduct that had a nexus to a pending con, uh, contemplated proceeding and were done with corrupt intent, each of which under department's principles of federal prosecution guiding charging decisions would need to be proven beyond a reasonable doubt to establish an obstruction of justice case. And again, they reported no actions that would reach that level. So it was a sweeping victory all the way around on this issue. Uh, and, and I think this is a good day for the United States. Jay, one thing we pointed out, it looked like it was a perjury trap, that if the president had gone on, there's, there's almost no way that you can get avoid perjury, and you and Rudy kept him from going onto that uh, trap. Uh, how did you get it done? Well, look, the president wanted to be fully transparent and fully cooperative, and he was. I mean, 1.4 million pages of documents were sent over to the special counsel. Dozens and dozens of witness interviews by White House officials for hundreds of hours took place. And, and we provided uh, responses in writing. So I actually think what happened here was uh, a request for a, a, an interview with the president, which they made, we did not think was appropriate under the law. In other words, the law that establishes the basis upon which you would have the right to basically interview the president, which would require uh, under the ESPY standard that you couldn't get this information from any place else, that they could never meet it. And that's ultimately why I do not think they sought a subpoena. Let me ask you about what these congressmen are doing. Uh, it's my understanding that they have to be, it has to be pursuant to some legislative initiative to uh, go through all these uh, subpoenas and so forth. Um, am I correct in that or is there, can they just go on a fishing ex expedition? You're 100% correct. So there has to be what's called a legitimate legislative purpose for them to move forward with the hearing. So you've got Judiciary and House Intel, and, uh, and they've got oversight. And the question you have to ask your first question you have to ask is, what is the appropriate legislative purpose for these inquiries? And that is issue number one. And here's another thing that I think is very important for the American people to understand. This went on for two years with the auspices of a special counsel. And as I said, they issued 2,800 subpoenas. 
They interviewed, they uh, executed 500 search warrants, 500. They obtained more than 30, 230 orders for communication records, issued almost 50 orders ordering, uh, authorizing the use of pen registers, and that's how you track phone numbers going back and forth. 13 requests to foreign governments for evidence and interviewed approximately 500 witnesses and came to the conclusion, no obstruction, no collusion. So uh, what is it exactly the House is doing? Are uh, you guys it's going politics. to go after the Democrats on declaratory judgment to say that they need to shut them down? Or are you going to just... The way it them? works is the, the White House counsel will be, is initially responsive to document requests that come in uh, to the White House in official capacity, whether it's to witnesses or to the White House or to a department. Our job will be requests that come to either us as lawyers or come to clients or our client, the president, and we are going to respond accordingly. Uh, I will tell you that. We will respond accordingly and we will respond appropriately. But this is a little bit in the land of the absurd that after this report, you would see at this particular time, in my view, with all of those information, with all that information I just gave you about the scope and nature and depth of this report, that they would allow this to continue in the House and Senate, they should be legislating, not investigating. Um, are you going to get any rest now that this thing's over? <laughs> too much. Well, you know, the week is early. <laughs> Look, okay. as you know, Pat, and I appreciate your call. You've been calling and checking on me, and I appreciated that. Look, this has been a, 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 a tremendous, I, I, for a lawyer to handle a case like this at the highest levels, representing a president of the United States, there's not a, highest, a higher honor. Uh, it was exhilarating. It was, uh, it, it, it was challenging. It was allowing me to use all the skills that I was trained to use. And I told my colleagues the other day, we were all trained for these moments. And let's remember that. That's what we were trained to do. And it was by God's grace that we, um, we saw a great conclusion. And I thank our legal team. And there will be more work to do. But hopefully it will not be at quite the intensity of, let's say, the last two years. Congratulations. God bless you. Thanks, Pat. Appreciate Jay, it. Jay Sekulow, who is uh, president's counsel, he's the he and Rudy Giuliani together, the chief counsel of this entire matter. Uh, he is, of course, you know, the chief counsel of the American Center for Law and Justice. Uh, he's been a dear friend for many years. We now have CBN chief political analyst David Brody is joining with us, and uh, uh, David, uh, politically, this is a, a huge win for the president. What do you think it's going to mean for 2020? Well, there's so much to unpack here, Pat. Uh, first of all, I think it's pretty clear the media has taken a huge hit here. As a matter of fact, uh, if journalism had flags in their newsroom, they'd be flying at half staff today. Uh, a lot of mourning around the country within mainstream media circles, for sure. Look, as for 2020, Democrats have a choice. When do they want to stop digging the grave? I mean, it really is that simple. Uh, do they want to spend their time, their platform, their energy, their focus, their power in the House uh, on the 2020 agenda? and try to beat Donald Trump at the ballot box, or do they want to go down the investigative road? Uh, look, this is a special counsel that has done its work. Robert Mueller is now done. But there's a new special counsel in town, Pat. It's Adam Schiff, uh, the House Intelligence Committee chairman, uh, Elijah Cummings as well, another chairman in the House, and Gerald Nather, the House Judiciary Committee chairman. That's the new special counsel in Washington now. They're informal, if you will. I'll put them in air quotes. But they have to decide, and I think it's pretty clear that they've already decided, we're going to go down this road and try and get Donald Trump any way, any form, any fashion. And if they do that, they suck the oxygen from the 2020 race, and it becomes all sorts of problems down the road for Democrats. Doesn't it, uh, don't they see that the American people are sick of this, that the American people want the president to do his job, and they want America to go forward? This is not in support of the United States. It's in support of their political agenda, don't you think? For sure, Pat, that's a really great point. Look, the American people are not stupid. They may not be as informed as they need to be as a voting electorate, but they're not stupid when it comes to being street smart. Uh, they understand the deal here. Look, the no collusion, no collusion, no collusion is what Trump had been saying for all of this time. That was the big enchilada, and the big enchilada became nada, nothing. It's over. And folks realize that. So all of this other stuff, all of these extra investigations, it, look, if Robert Mueller, the nonpartisan guy, supposedly, uh, some people would argue with that, obviously, but look, if he's the nonpartisan guy and 500 witnesses, 2,800 subpoenas, he couldn't find anything, 
do, do the American people really think that the Democrats are going to be fair in this process? Well, of course not. Look, I think the Democrats have a major credibility problem here. You had for two years they were talking about that this is going to be collusion, and it wasn't. And let's go back to Brett Kavanaugh. They were playing political games there as well, and they took a major black eye on that. You put those two things together, and you have a credibility narrative with the Democrats that could really, really hurt them in 2020. Uh, Lindsey Graham was saying, I think there should be a general special counsel to investigate the Justice Department and, and those who uh, were engaging in all this uh, uh, spy stuff against the president. What do you think? Well, I think they're going to go down that road. I mean, Donald Trump wants to go down that road. The, how, uh, Lindsey Graham, who's the chair of the Senate Judiciary Committee, uh, seems to want to do that as well. As a matter of fact, James Comey uh, tweeted yesterday, the former FBI director, he tweeted, so many questions is what he put. And Lindsey Graham tweeted back, Jim, you're absolutely right. I'll see you here in front of my committee. Uh, they're going to go down this road for sure. Uh, I think there is a potential problem, though, for this president and for the Republican Party. Look, they've won. Do your 24-hour victory lap. But if you're going to continue down this road, and I understand they want to have investigations, and that makes sense. But at the same time, maybe it might be a good idea. They have to think about this. It's something they'll have to contemplate if they just want to kind of move on, take the victory, take the W, if you will, and, and then play for 2020 rather than continuing to relitigate some of this and keep it in the news. Um, I noticed Marco Rubio was saying that the uh, Green New Deal won't really help the rising waters. He's got a proposal, you know, for a government study that will really do some good uh, helping the coastal areas. And the Green New Deal can sink the ship, don't you think? I mean, it looks like that uh, the young woman is taking all the old men onto the boat with her. <laughs> it may be a cruise to nowhere. Yeah, well, the young woman, AOC, is now she's being called because no one wants to say Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. So we just call her AOC. It saves uh, breath and it saves syllables. Uh, but yes, uh, for sure, uh, she has this Green New Deal, as you know, Pat, uh, and it's radical. Uh, and, and look, that's not just uh, conservatives saying that. That's even some uh, moderates in the party, the Democrat Party. They're very concerned about where this is going. Uh, you know, Donald Trump uh, made fun of it the other day in his two-hour CPAC speech, talking about that the only way we're going to be able to watch television uh, in the future, according to the Green New Deal, is if the wind blows the right way. I mean, who in the world knows what's going to happen? Of course, the, the, the pie in the sky scenario, and I'm not making this up. This is their document. Uh, they'd love to see, they, the progressives, AO see the Green Deal, they would love to see a nation, an America, without airplanes. Of course, the Democrat senator from Hawaii said, well, how am I going to get home? So, look, I mean, it, it's a whole big kit and caboodle of socialism that the Democrats are going to have to really come to reckon with here. So you've got no collusion. Uh, you've got that problem for the Democrats. You've got the socialism problem. And we haven't even gotten to late-term abortion. Uh, that's the trifecta, Pat. Uh, would you like to predict the uh, outcome of the 2020 election uh, against some nameless Democrat with the president? Well, uh, Pat, thank you so much for giving me that opportunity. But no, <laughs> I'd rather not. Uh, what we've learned in Washington and in politics and in this town specifically, it can change from day to day. I will say this, though. It is going to all matter about who that candidate is on the Democrat side. Look, if it's a, if it's a Joe Biden you got the blue, uh, the blue collar Democrats in play. If it's someone on a very progressive scale, then they're going to have to do their job, the Democrats, to get out minorities and suburban women. But look, I think this, this Mueller report and no collusion is going to hurt Democrats at the ballot box because moderates and independents in the middle will see this and say, hmm, you know what? Trump was right all along. The media has done Donald Trump a huge, wonderful service. They have given his fake news mantra credibility and no collusion. This report is the cherry on top of the fake news Sunday. <laughs> David, thank you. We look forward to having you on. Thank you again, brother. David Brody, our political correspondent, doing a superb job as always. Well, in other news, the latest rocket attack on Israel could lead to a major confrontation between Israel and Hamas because that rocket hit near Tel Aviv and it came from Gaza. Ephraim Graham has that. 
Well, Pat, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu is cutting short his trip to the United States after Hamas rocket struck a house just north, as you said, of Tel Aviv. The rocket slammed into the home just before dawn, wounding seven Israelis, including children. Israel is mobilizing its defense forces and calling up reserves as Netanyahu promises a strong response. This was a vicious attack on the state of Israel. We react with might. In the light of the security events, I've decided to cut short my visit in the U.S. The early return means Netanyahu will not be addressing the pro-Israel APAC conference in Washington. Some good news, though, for the Jewish state coming out of APAC Sunday. Leaders from Romania and Honduras announced those nations are moving their embassies to Jerusalem following the United States' lead. Pat? Thanks, Ephraim. Well, phew. That's why we need a president to pay attention to what's going on in the world, because the, the hot spots are developing. It looks like we wiped out the last vestiges of ISIS, but nevertheless, uh, they will regroup. So we need to stay strong uh, in the Middle East with uh, forces. We cannot pull everybody out, and that's true. Uh, the, the challenges are enormous, and down is Venezuela. I read today, and I, it's not confirmed, but it's one of those uh, Drudge Report things that there may be some Russian troops coming into Venezuela to bolster Maduro. Of course, that, we're talking about the Monroe Doctrine. That's pretty serious stuff. But we'll see what's happening. We, we don't have uh, any more on that right now, but keep, keep, keep your eyes open for what's going on. It's an amazing world, but... I would hate to see war, but, you know, that, that territory in Gaza should never have been given back. Uh, it was one of those things that was a mistake. Uh, the uh, Jewish settlers were there. They had a presence, a superb presence. They would have maintained law and order in that, in that region. Then they pulled out, and there was a vacuum. And so instead of a peaceful transition, Hamas, which is a radical group, was the controlling factor of the uh, Palestinian Authority in Gaza. Now there's firing rockets into northern Israel. Israel is going to retaliate. They always do, and they'll go back and forth. War in the Middle East, I hate to see it, but it looks like it's coming. Terry? Well, up next, the first Hispanic coach in the NBA. And he's working for the greatest basketball player of all time. To walk in his home and be interviewed and spend time with him was surreal for me. Someone that knows basketball extremely high level. We'll go up close and personal with the Charlotte Hornets' James Borrego when we come back. The Charlotte Hornets' James Borrego is the first Hispanic head coach in the NBA's 72-year history, and he was hired by one of his childhood idols, team owner Michael Jordan. Well, the coach sat down with our sports reporter, Tom Buring, to talk about what it's like to work for one of baseball's all-time greatest players. In a game of rebounds, James Borrego has the knack for bouncing back. His resiliency and persistence turned heads. After long success and two championships as a San Antonio Spurs assistant, the Charlotte Hornets hired him, and he became the NBA's first Hispanic head coach. But the three-time head coaching finalist had to wait his turn. When was the wait most difficult? Believing I was the next guy, being turned down, finalist again, two jobs, two no's. But I kept being persistent, finding resilience to keep moving forward. Being an NBA assistant coach for 15, 16 years, the wait was long, but I knew if I continued to put my work in, that opportunity would come again, and I'm thankful for it. How do you fuel your disappointment rather than resenting it? Well, I think you look at it as an opportunity. Through disappointments in life, that's on the court, in practice, in games, as long as you're learning from it, I think you get better along the way. I found a, a spirit of resiliency reflected in my mother that she could get up and she could keep going through the ups, through the downs of life. And I was given that gift at an early age of moving forward and seeing that example. Well, an owner is an owner unless you're wearing <laughs> it, right? So you come here under the evaluation of Hornets owner Michael Jordan. So what made that memorable for you? First of all, never met him. Obviously one of the greatest players of all time, someone I grew up watching, admiring from afar. To walk in his home and be interviewed and spend time with him was surreal for me. Someone that knows basketball extremely high level, he was interested in me to hear my vision, what I could help bring his company, his organization. 
It was a wonderful conversational basketball life, moving this team forward. And we spent a lot of time watching a basketball game, talking X's and O's, but he's been a wonderful owner, someone that brings great value, uh, someone who I trust and someone who I know believes in me and this entire group. Was there a favorite question he asked? Who did you grow up rooting for? No. <laughs> <laughs> Your mandate was Bulls? <laughs> Bulls all the way. <laughs> he didn't know I was really a Laker fan, but. Talent aside, what's at the core of a champion? Hmm. There's a lot there. It's effort. It's effort in your consistency, effort in your discipline, effort to stay resilient. Mm -hmm. If you have those three things, you got a shot. People look at NBA champions and they think it just happens because of talent or coaching or you add this player or that. You have to put the time in. You have to put the effort in every day. And that's a challenge. What is it about JB that makes him unique as a coach? Well, first of all, he's a, he's a, he's a great guy. Well, he's helping me think a lot about the game and about different situations and things of that nature. So I think that's, that's, that's what's different about him. He's really on the mic. We have you know, a great relationship because he's been with me 10 years in San Antonio and uh, we trust each other. So when he asked me to, to and, and help him out, uh, I was just happy about the opportunity and I knew that I can trust him. Today's NBA player, they're getting younger, they're global. What is a must have to earn their trust? They are getting global. It's becoming more and more of a challenge. You have to be authentic. Players today, they'll see right through you and you won't earn their trust. And I think that's what Christ is looking for in us, you know, to be authentic and real. And that's really what elevates an organization when there's real authentic connection and relationship. And I think that's what players are looking for. What has multicultural friendships, teaming taught you? Growing up in New Mexico, you know, Hispanic background, it's about family, that we pull for each other, we're there for each other, just as the church should be. Uh, there's room to disagree, no matter if I'm Hispanic, white, black, Asian, we're just a family. And I think that's what Christ would want us to, to represent and to be about. That's something I value at my core and something that I, I wanna be known for long-term. You're doing your doctorate now, but you have your master's in leadership. What do you think is most undervalued when it comes to moving people forward? One of the things I've learned over the years watching great leaders and studying leadership is listening to people, understanding people, empathizing with people. You can help move them forward, but you got to understand people and where they're at to do that. Sometimes it's a little messy, and I think it's about listening. When you listen to them, you value them, and when people feel valued, they'll keep coming back to you. So you were brought in to help change, redefine the culture of this organization. But over your broad experience with coaching, what about the pushback that comes from leadership at times where it's like, we don't want to change? What's your advice? Get over yourself. Hmm. We're not in it for the ego. I'm not standing up on a perch thinking that I got everything figured out, but stepping in the muck, in the, in the fire, in the arena, put ourselves in the battlefield together, pull out the best in people, see what they do well and maximize it. The good leaders I've been around, they go tap into that. Coach up the church, evaluate their mission, their game plan. What would your encouragement be to them to finish strong? Probably tell them something I tell my players often. As they exit a huddle, exit a, a halftime, stay the course, stay together. This is a long game. This is a long season. We need each other. Stay together, stay the course, keep pulling, and ultimately communicate talking, but it's also listening. What do you borrow from Christ's example when leading and coaching a team? I think of two things, sacrifice and resiliency. Who is the ultimate example of that? The ultimate sacrifice for us, never giving in, always getting back up, always being there. Just realizing you can't do it on your own, mm. that you need a partner, mm. and he's the ultimate partner. James Borrego, the new coach for the Charlotte Hornets. And boy, you could pull apart that interview and get some real yeah, nuggets terrific, for life. Right? Yeah, okay. Well, speaking of nuggets for life, it's time for your questions and oh, some man, honest answers. So Pat, this first one comes from Jacob, who says, Pat, what is the biggest challenge you faced in the ministry? Well, it's, it's hard to designate one challenge. <laughs> we have challenges all the time. But uh, I think the first one, of course, is starting. I had $70, and uh, the Lord had sent me to buy a television station. I didn't even own a television set. I didn't know anything about television. So what's the biggest challenge was to 
to buy that station and put it on the air. That was the first challenge that I've, there's been challenges ever since. I mean, it's like I've had a life under pressure year after year after year after year. They just, the bigger you get, the more, the bigger the challenges are. So that was the biggest one though. It's just getting going. I mean, just coming alive. Okay, this is Beth who says, one of my biggest fears is death and not knowing where I'm going. I try to live my life as a good Christian, but how do we know if we've disappointed God in some way? Can I rest in the fact that once saved, we are always saved, or is that not true? Uh, I don't think that's what you ought to rest in. You ought to rest in the fact that you're walking with the Lord. Uh, if we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship one with the other, and the blood of Jesus Christ continuously cleanses us from sin. So there's a walk. You keep on walking with the Lord, and you keep on being cleansed by the blood, and you keep on being saved, and the Holy Spirit continues to bear witness with your spirit that you're children of God. And uh, that, that's, that's what it is. It's a, it's a life being lived in the presence and alongside of the Lord in you, you and the Lord. Uh, that, that's what salvation is, is Christ in you, the hope of glory. So that's what you need to, and if you, if you have the presence, the Holy Spirit will bear witness with your, child, with your spirit that you're a child of God. So rest in that. Don't, don't always be worrying about are you saved or not saved. I mean, do what the Bible says. Give your heart to the Lord and let him take care of the rest. And this is Connie who says, commercials are showing more and more homosexual couples on them. I'm tired of seeing women kissing, a man sitting in his lover's lap, etc. Is there nothing we can do? We should not have to change the channel because of a 30 or 60 second commercial. Well, I, I'm, I'm sorry uh, that it's the way it is, but the truth is, if a lot of people change the channel, then the people who are putting that stuff on won't be able to sell products. It all depends on audience. Television is based on audience. Audience is what brings on commercials. Commercial the advertisers buy time on the basis of ratings, and the ratings depend on how many people watch. I mean, it's just that simple. And I've programmed TV stations, and I know about all that stuff. But uh, you say, what can you do? I it grieves me to see this blatant uh, assault on our values. That goes on under the guise of entertainment. It's just there all the time. And what can you do about it? Well, I think the best thing you can do is not watch. Uh, but uh, other than that, you know, we can't live our lives constantly protesting. We, you know, what is it Father Keller said? It's better to light a candle than to curse the darkness. Let, let, let's be a light where we are and watch what happens. This is Devin who says, I believe in God, but I don't believe he loves everyone like you said he does. I don't think he loves me. <laughs> I've been dealt one bad hand after another. I've been such a loser all my life. I want to live the rest of my life a winner. What can I do to change the course of my life? Well, the Bible says a man shall eat good through the fruit of his lips. And that means you begin to speak a positive confession. What you just f finished telling me was a constant litany of failure. You're a loser, your life has been nothing but bad, and so forth and so on. Why don't you start saying, today, this is the day the Lord hath made, and I will rejoice and be glad in it. God loves me, and I'm his child. I've given myself to Jesus, and I am one with Christ, and he is my savior, and he's cleansed me from sin. Why don't you just begin to confess stuff? How do you change your life with your mouth? Speak it. Mm -hmm. This is Barbara who says, God answered our prayers. We now own a home, but it's a fixer-upper and it needs major work. Is it wrong of me to pray for help in fixing up our home that was built in 1989? I long to have a full bathroom downstairs. <laughs> yes. We are good people, have six grown children. Five of them serve or have served in our military. Is it okay for me to pray and ask God for financial help? Well, what does Jesus say in the, the Lord's Prayer? Give us this day our daily bread. Well, your daily bread is getting that bathroom fixed. There's nothing wrong with asking God to help you do a fixer-upper. I mean, of course he'll give you help. But the thing you can do, if you, if you get everything ready, get the plans ready, get people lined up, get, get your carpenters lined up, get the, the material lined up, get everything ready to go, and what you need is God to do the, 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 the impossible and give you the money to make it happen. But if we do everything we can and get it ready, and, you know, he said, you know, you, you, 
you pray and you believe that you've already received it and you will have the thing as you say. Barbara, this is from a man who knows what it means to do that, <laughs> follow his instruction. All right. This is a viewer, Pat, who says, several times in the Gospels, Jesus performs a miracle and tells the person or the group to, quote, tell no one. Yet, they always did. If Jesus knew they'd not respect his request, why did he bother telling them to tell no one? Well, look, uh, I'm not Jesus, and I can't tell you what was in his mind at any given point of time. He didn't want people coming after him to get food, to get miracles, uh, to, to get things. He wanted them to love him because he was the Son of God and he was going to die for their sins and he was going to go to heaven. And if they accepted him as Savior, they would be saved. That's what he wanted. And he was, it, it seemed like they wanted a king. They wanted somebody as their leader. They wanted an earthly presence as a leader. They wanted a, a commander of the army. They wanted somebody to take charge of their government. That wasn't what his role was. And so he didn't want a whole lot of people running around saying, Jesus for king. <laughs> you know, he, he wanted to be Jesus the Savior. That, that's what he wanted. So, of course, they, they, they did contrary to what he said, but they didn't always do that. So, but that's what was on his heart, all right? Well, that's all the time we have for today. Thank you for your questions and some great answers today. Thanks, Thank Pat. you, ma'am. Well, still ahead, a woman with such severe hip pain, she couldn't even walk. Couldn't even leave my house unless I had help from somebody. My doctor took an x-ray and he said it was bone on bone. Watch how she supernaturally healed. That's coming up later. And welcome to this CBN News Break. A key road in Mozambique is now open and more international aid is arriving to help those devastated by the catastrophic flooding caused by a cyclone. Right now, at least 750 people have died due to the natural disaster and that death toll could rise to more than 1,000 people. Relief efforts are underway, including setting up some much needed sanitation facilities to produce clean water for tens of thousands of people. Humanitarian groups are also trying to address the massive need for shelter. The Spanish version of the 700 Club is making a strong digital impact. Club 700 Oiredes, or the 700 Club Today Network, produces content for its Spanish-speaking audience to build a community of faith through discipleship. Its Facebook page has now reached more than 190,000 followers and more than 20,000 followers on Twitter. Its social media campaigns have resulted in close to 16,000 people receiving salvation. You can find out more about what CBN is doing around the world by going to CBN.com slash international. Pat and Terry are back with more today's 700 Club right after this. Well, Miriam and her family fled their home in Iraq after ISIS returned and said they were going to kill every Christian in their city. Well, they left everything behind. The family eventually joined a, a refuge group in Jordan where they had no jobs, no money, no food or rent. Miriam is a Christian refugee whose family had to flee their home in Mosul, Iraq to escape ISIS. We heard over the loudspeakers of the mosque that ISIS was going to kill every Christian in the city. In the past, I worked with the U.S. military as a driver. If ISIS found that out, my whole family will be slaughtered immediately. The family had to walk through the desert for two days until someone offered them a ride. They eventually came to Amman, Jordan. We are not allowed to have jobs, and it's very expensive paying for food and rent. I don't care about myself. I just want my wife and daughter to have food to eat. We can't afford to register Miriam in school, and this is the time in her life when she needs an education. It makes me very sad, but through it all, we have kept our faith. Jesus will provide. When Operation Blessing met Miriam's family, we took them shopping for food and hygiene products. From our first days in Jordan until now, I have not met anyone as nice as you. You have brought us joy and we are so grateful for your help. Miriam is now enrolled in our Operation Blessing funded Christian school. 
Each student is given a handmade uniform, books, snacks, and bus rides to and from school. We even have a staff nurse and a clinic we keep stocked with medicine that's available to all the refugees free of charge. I really love this school and all of the teachers there treat us really well. I get to eat, play, and study with all of my friends. It's the best. It makes me very happy that this is a school that teaches Christian values focused on Jesus. The school even has some small maintenance projects that Miriam's dad's been able to work on. In exchange, the school helps him with his expenses. I'm very grateful to you for supporting us and the other Christian refugees from Iraq. You are helping us as Jesus would, and he will bless you abundantly. Before we felt like we had been forgotten, but I'm so happy now because you thought of us. Thank you so much for praying for us and taking care of us. I love you. Well, as the Lord said, inasmuch as you've done it to the least of these, my brethren, you've done it unto me. Helping those people is like helping Jesus himself. And so you're doing that. And thank you so much. People who are 700 Club members say, what does it take to be a 700 Club member? 65 cents a day, $20 a month. It's, it's pennies. Most people, you know, that's the small change in your pocket. You ignore it. 65 cents is nothing. You can't get a can of soda pop for anything close to that much. And if you smoke cigarettes, good grief, that, that's a tiny fraction of what you'd have to pay. But this is changing lives. And I thank you. And I ask you, if you haven't joined the 700 Club, please do, because we, we want to give you something. We have something called the I Wills of God that seems to be very popular. It, it has touched a lot of lives. It's the 91st Psalm, and there's a passage in there that says, here's what God's going to do. I'm going to bless you. I'm going to uphold you. I'm going to defend you. I'm going to do all these things because he has set his love upon me, the Lord said. Now, this is the God of heaven. So th th these are very important. So as you join the 700 Club, this is going to be our present to you as you help us help others. Well, Pat, this is Raymond. He lives in Oakland, California, and this is what he said, having seen the DVD. He said, the I Wills of God DVD is an inspiring testimony of how the Lord heals and delivers. I always like to see how Pat answers questions with the wisdom he receives from God. How he overcomes his obstacles makes me want to do better each day. So Raymond has loved his, and you're going to love your copy of the I Wills of God as well. A great opportunity to make a difference in the world. Amen. Mm -hmm. Well, when we come back, we're going to be praying for you and your needs. So stay with us. We'll be back in a moment. Hope Cuellar became a prisoner in her own home after her right hip began locking up on her. With every step she took, she was fearful of falling. Hope suffered like this for 18 months, and then one day she was healed in an instant in her living room chair. For decades, Hope Cuellar dealt with limited mobility in her left leg after injuring it in a car accident. But when her right hip started locking up, she became almost totally immobile. My good leg was my right leg. That one did all the work. And then all of a sudden, one day I couldn't move it. It was very painful, scary, because my doctor took an x-ray and he said it was bone on bone. Steroid injections helped, but when they wore off, the pain returned. I couldn't walk. It just hurt so bad. I couldn't even leave my house unless I had help from somebody. It was really bad. I would walk and be afraid that at any moment I was going to freeze and I couldn't put my foot down. It was my pain, my hurt. Nobody knew. It was just me. For a year and a half, Hope prayed for healing. One day it came while she was watching the 700 Club. Someone else's problems with your right hip. Yeah. It's just not moving properly and it's very painful. And you walk with a limp. God is healing you. He's restoring. He's making everything new again. I jumped up and I said, that's me, that's me. Heal me, Jesus, please heal me in Jesus' name. I felt the warmth come in my arm all the way down and I was crying and I was crying and just accepting the healing. I knew it, I knew it, I felt it. 
The pain is all gone. I can walk and put one little foot in front of the other, and that's all because of Jesus. He loves us. At her next appointment, Hope told her doctor she was done with steroid shots. I said, because Jesus healed me, I'm walking, she just smiled. Like, I don't know if they believe all that, but hey, God was there before they were. <laughs> it's true, and God will help anybody they ask because He loves us, and He is there to help us. We just have to ask and believe. That is a creative miracle, bone on bone. Yeah. I mean, she'd lost the padding in there and God healed yeah. her completely. Well, that, How amazing. It's amazing. That's wonderful. It really is. Here's a report, Pat, from Tennessee. Rachel lives in Loudoun, Tennessee. She had severe symptoms in her eyes, including pressure, throbbing, and swelling. She couldn't even close them at times. Her doctor also found bleeding behind her eyes and diagnosed her with macular degeneration. Well, one day, Rachel was watching this program and prayed with you, Pat, believing God for a hearing. When she went back to her specialist, he tested her again. This time, there was nothing wrong with her eyes. Wow. He even did a second test because he couldn't believe the images could possibly be correct. Her specialist discharged her, and Rachel gives all the glory to God. Wow. I was reading in Corinthians yesterday. Uh, the Apostle Paul said, My preaching did not come to you in word only, but in demonstration of the Holy Spirit and power. And I think that if we're going to minister the name of the Lord, we're going to minister in Holy Spirit power. In, in, in the power of the Holy Spirit and, and uh, the same power of God. And what we're seeing over and over again on this program is the power of God. Uh, you know, uh, it, it's not valid if, if it doesn't, it isn't accompanied by the power of God. Paul said, look, I didn't come with just words. If I'd come with just words, it wouldn't have been anything. I came with demonstration of the Holy Spirit and power. And that's, that, that, thank God for this. But here's somebody. Her name is Cindy. She lives in Mesa, Arizona. She had abdominal issues that caused multiple pains through her body. It was really, and she was watching this program, and Terry, you said, quote, someone else, you have chronic intestinal issues, and you'll know this is because you have multiple conditions, and God is setting you free, and you feel warmth in your belly as God just uh, heals you completely. And before Terry even spoke the word of knowledge, Cindy began to feel a warmth come over her, and she said, God healed me. Okay. Let's pray. Demonstration of the Holy Spirit and power. Father, in Jesus' name, Jesus. nothing is impossible with you. We confess to you, Lord, that we believe. We confess we are unworthy sinners. Lord, we are sinners. And like Jesus said, when you've done everything, say we're unprofitable servants. We've done our duty. We're unprofitable servants. And yet, Lord, you are gracious and you are all powerful. Mm -hmm. Somebody else with a right hip, uh, degenerate condition, almost like what you heard before. God just touched you and healed you in the name of Jesus. Get up and walk in his name. Someone else with tinnitus on the right ear, you, ear you've been yes. listening to that for years, and it is gone now. Thank you, Lord. Thanks. Thank you, Lord. There's a tightness in your chest. It's like a band across your chest. You feel pressure. It's not a heart attack, but it feels just like a heart attack. And it's a type of angina. You just got freed from that. In the name of Jesus, be healed. And someone else, you've been diagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis, you, but Lord. God is reversing that for you. That stiffness, the swelling in your hands, it's all gone Thank in you. Jesus' name. Through right, this audience, may the anointing of the Lord touch you now. May you see his gracious power in your life in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, that's all the time we've got. Thanks so much for being with us. We leave you with uh, today's power minute. Do not be afraid, only believe. Well, tomorrow, the Orlando Magic's uh, Pat Williams, Pat Williams. Yeah. Uh, he's a great guy. He'll be telling us something important that you don't want to miss. So until then, this is Pat Robertson for Terry and all of us. We'll see you tomorrow. Bye-bye.